And that concludes the report of the strategic planning team of the Hebrew Liberation Presbytery. We will now take questions from the floor. If you have a question, please come to the microphone and I remind you please to state your name and which tribe you represent. Yes, sir. Yes, Jonadab, tribe of Benjamin. I have a question for you. How long do you think this journey is going to take? Well, we estimate that the journey from Egypt to the land that God promised to our forebears should take about three months. We don't know. I, I know that sounds very long, but we are accounting for the enfeebled and some of the births that we expect to happen along the way. And what are we going to eat? Now, that's a very good question. I want to clarify that for everybody. As we are leaving Egypt, we believe we will be flush with gifts. We know already that the Egyptians are planning a fundraiser for our going away party. <laughs> and as we leave Egypt, we will be carrying with us some, some gold and some treasures with which they have equipped us. And that should carry us part of the journey. But at some point along the way, we expect exorbitant prices from the Hivites and the Jebusites particularly. Yeah. And so at some point along the way, we're going to run out of money. At which point, we will eat manna. Manna? What is it? Precisely. <laughs> no, really. What is this stuff you call manna? Uh, well, it, I mean, it's bread. Uh, Breadish. <laughs> it, it, it's kind of a white coriander seed. It, it's only sweeter. It, I, I don't know. It, it's it's, it's kind of like honey. I hope that helps. Uh, excuse me, uh, your name and the tribe you represent, please. I'm Abigail, tribe of Manasseh. Could you spec speak into the microphone and yes, pull it down so people me. can hear you? Thank you. Well, how do we grow this, this manna? Oh, well, you don't really, uh, you don't grow it. It, um, it, it falls from the sky. Like, like rain? Um, more like the morning dew. When you wake up in the morning, it, there it will be. It will have fallen while you were sleeping. Yes. So the ground's really going to get quite mucky and thick as we journey? I'm well, as a matter of fact, um, no, because this manna, which is not collected, will then dissipate by around noon when the sun has shone on it. And we just gather it up? Yes, you just gather it up. But, but I should tell you, we will gather only enough for each person in your tent to have one omer and, and nothing more. Why can't we gather a lot of it? I'm sorry, can I have your name and your tribe, um, please? Eldad, tribe of Levi. Eldad, I always thought was a male name, but okay, Eldad. Um, <laughs> please, don't let that prohibit well, you. Yeah. Looks can be deceptive. Okay. Yes, sir, please. So, okay, so... So just in case, for a rainy day. Oh, you want to gather more than one omer per person? Um, well, uh, no, you, you can't do that, because if you gather two days' worth, then we're going to have to fumigate your tent for maggots. Maggots? Yeah. Um, well, then it means that we have to work on the Sabbath if we want to eat on the Sabbath. Uh, no. In, in fact, it doesn't. Now, if you stay with me on this, okay. Eldad. If you go out on Monday and collect two omers per person, then the extra omer is going to go to the pot overnight, and you will wake up with maggots the next morning. However, if you gather two omers per person the day before the Sabbath, then you don't have to gather uh, manna on the Sabbath. So we eat maggots on the Sabbath. <laughs> no, no, because the, it will not spoil that which you gather before the Sabbath. Ah, okay. Uh, who doesn't it. spoil on the Sabbath? It's God's day. Okay. God knows okay, what God Okay, let me God see if I have this straight. All right. Magic food falls each morning. Yes. Disappears each noon. Yes. Spoils each night, except prior to the Sabbath. Yes and yes. And tastes like honey grams. Yes. That's your plan. That's our strategic plan that we have developed. <laughs> and what do you expect us to drink on the journey? Water from a rock? Well, I think we can safely assume that the wilderness journey from Egypt to the Promised Land was not the result of a strategic planning committee. 
If a strategic planning committee had plotted out the wilderness journey from Egypt to the Promised Land, then they would have skipped entirely the whole manna thing. They would have skipped entirely water from a rock. They would have skipped 40 years in the wilderness and taken actually a beeline straight to the Promised Land. And they would have skipped things like Moses disappearing for 40 days at a time into the top of a stormy mountain top. If the strategic planning commission of the Hebrew Liberation Presbytery had planned the journey, we would have missed out on a number of things. The book of Exodus would be considerably smaller and we could have done away entirely with Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, <laughs> which most of us miss when we try to read the Bible straight through. Anyway, if the strategic planning team had put together the plan and execution of the plan for leaving Egypt and going to the Promised Land. We also would have missed out on the Ten Commandments, as well as the other 613 ordinances that God gave the people of Israel. We would have missed out on the trials that they had. They would have missed out on becoming a people with a real identity. Anybody, anybody can be faithful when they have gold in their pocket or when their water is pure or when their bellies are full. But the people of Israel spent 40 years on an unplanned, extremely long journey. 40 years of facing moments when they didn't know what lie ahead. 40 years of facing moments when they didn't know what they would eat the next day. And it was in the, the fire of, of trials, trials and testing that the people of Israel developed an identity of the people of God. Which God? The God whose steadfast love endures forever. The God for whom they receive manna in the morning and on whom they can trust that there will be manna tomorrow. And so they don't hoard today's bread because they trust that they have bread for the next day, coming from the same storehouse of God. I speak to you this evening as a member of the Generative Catalyst team. In some respects, we're the strategic planning team of the Presbytery of Los Ranchos. And in many respects, we do our job fairly well. We listen as best we can to you and your stories and what God is doing among you. We read the scriptures and we listen as best we can for what God is saying to us on how to be faithful today. We also, uh, we pray together, we deliberate together. We listen to the latest studies, we strategize together, we, we, we think about where God is leading us. But sometimes God leads us on a journey that cannot be predicted. And sometimes God leads us in a place where we can't simply get a group of sharp thinkers together and come up with what God wants us to do next. And in our meetings, we have come to call this space liminal space, space that is somewhere in between what we know and where we're going. And it's a very discomforting, disquieting thing to be in liminal space. We feel that is one way of naming where the Presbytery of Los Ranchos is. We feel that is one way of naming where the Presbyterian Church USA is. And many of us feel after reading the Pew uh, research that came out two weeks ago that that's where the Christian Church in America is. Richard Rohr describes liminal space this way. It's a unique spiritual position where human beings hate to be, but where the biblical God is always leading them. It is when you have left the tried and true, but have not yet been able to replace it with anything else. 
It is when you are finally out of the way. It is when you are between your old comfort zone and any possible new answer. And if you are not trained in how to hold anxiety, how to live with ambiguity, how to entrust and wait, then you run. Anything to flee this terrible cloud of unknowing. For that kind of wilderness journey, there is no strategic plan. There is only trust. Trust that the God who gave birth to the church, the God who empowered the church on Pentecost, the God who lived through our forebears as they put together this group of scriptures and bequeathed them to us as a gift, the God who spoke mightily through the reformers, the God who was there when each of our churches in this presbytery was initiated by inspiration to trust that that same God is a God who accompanies us even when our strategic plan is unclear. And in that time of disquiet and discomfort, we trust that this God is up to something marvelous. Thanks be to God. Amen.